Okay, Amy, uh, Mr. Pennington is trying to log on right now, so he will be our last member. Okay, thank you. Dennis, you're muted. There, now can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting, of the Oklahoma City Planning Commission for Thursday, June the 11th, 2020. We're meeting by video conference because of the continued need for us to maintain social distancing. Getting a little bit of feedback there. Uh, thank you in advance for your participation and your patience. Uh, with this change in format, we're doing things a little bit differently. So here are a few things you need to know. If the video conference is disconnected at any time, um, during the meeting, the meeting will stop and it will reconvene once the connection is restored. If for any reason communications cannot be restored within 30 minutes, those items which have not been heard will be continued to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning Commission, which I believe is July the 9th, 2020 at 1.30 p.m., which will also be conducted by video conference. The agenda and documents are located on okc.gov. Staff will present each item to be heard, summarizing the application and identifying any points remaining to be resolved. Anyone who wishes to speak about an agenda item or speak under citizens be heard, hopefully you'll have previously notified staff by phone or email or will have signed up online and I'll call on you to speak at the appropriate time. If not, I'll also call for public comment on each agenda item, and anyone who calls in after their item can be heard, uh, after their item has been heard, will be allowed to speak under citizens to be heard. When called upon to speak, participants should state their name and address for the record. All comments and questions should be directed to the commission. Uh, because of the unusual circumstances and the challenges of this format, we'll hold pretty strictly to our time limits. So please be brief. If more than one person wishes to speak on an item, please try not to repeat comments already made. As participants call in, staff will mute, will unmute, yes, will mute the participants line. So keep your line on mute until you're recognized to speak and to unmute, you press um, star six. Staff will not mute the commissioners who are allowed to ask questions or comment at any time during the meeting. However, I would ask each of the commissioners to make them to mute themselves unless they wish to speak, um, just using the, the mute on your device. Otherwise, the background noise can be distracting. Please remember only one person can be heard at a time. If more than one person speaks, neither one can be heard. There will be a roll call every 30 minutes if necessary. Um, so let's call this meeting to order. I'm still getting some feedback. And for some reason, I have a prime gov instead of a Zoom. Um, screen. There's Mary. Um, so um, I understand Jeff Butler's not with us today. So JJ, are you here? Ready to go? I'm here. I'm ready. Okay. First Janice, time I to... May I interrupt? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm not showing Mary back on Prime Gov. Okay. So um, Mary, you're muted. 
Miss, Mrs. Chair, <laughs> yes. Powers, this is Frances. And yes. uh, of course, uh, due to timing, you can go ahead and take voice votes from those who aren't able to vote online. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you can just ask them yay or nay, or they can speak up at the motion when the motion's called. Okay. Thank you. My, so I, now I'm experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty. My prime gov screen on my uh, laptop has has disappeared, and I have a prime gov screen on my iPad, but I think we know from experience that it doesn't work very well. I did have this set up for the Zoom part of it. Um, so I'm not quite sure what's happening here. It must still have Zoom because I can see a little box down in the corner. Um, I mean, I believe, Russell, are, are you still yeah. on the line? Yes, ma'am. I believe that your iPad is still seeing the, um, the Zoom, but they're displaying the PrimeGov on it. So it appears oh. to be the PrimeGov screen but it is still, in fact, the Zoom. So on your laptop, you should still have your um, Prime Go. Uh, but I don't seem to. Um, let me see what I can do about that. Cindy, are you able to see her in Prime Go? Janice is connected in Prime Go. So, I am. So I don't have that. I don't have that on my. laptop screen so I can't see it. Okay, what you might need to do on your laptop screen is go to the bottom where you see that Chrome icon, that, yeah. that wheel, and if you'll click on it, it might bring up your um, your PrimeGov again for you. Oh, it sure did, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Are we so I still show I still show Miss Coffee not connected into Prime Go. Do we need to take a minute? Uh, Cindy, just do a roll roll call vote for her. She will just say yay or nay. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the first item on the agenda is the receipt of the minutes of the May 28th, 2020 meeting. Motion to receive. I'll wait for a button. So I have a motion by Asa Smith, Hi Smith, and um, a second by Mike Privet. That's not right, is it? That's Maybe. right. I beat him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> to receive the minutes of the May uh, 28th meeting. Cast your votes, please. I I guess I'm going to Mr. Hink Is Mr. Hinkle on with us? Do we know? I show him connected in Prime Gov. I see him in Zoom, but no microphone. Excuse me, yeah, he's muted. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello. Can you hear me? I can. Can you? Do you have your Prime Gov? Um, I do, but it's not giving me the the availability to vote. So I vote yes. And it happened last time too. It wouldn't ever give me the availability to vote or make a move for second. So 
I can see Aces, and I can see Michael Privet, and I can see that it passed, and it shows that I voted yes, but um, I don't have the ability to vote. Hey, Hinkle, what, what, browser, what browser are you using? This is Commissioner Coffee. I vote yes. I don't have the ability to vote on yet either. Well, if we have to, we can do voice votes for right. Commissioners uh, Coffee and Hinkle. I but I'm going to have to because I, I can't vote. I suspect some people are having pop-ups blocked and not allowing the uh, window to come up. Ah. Okay, well, in any event, the motion carried <laughs> and the minutes are received. Next item mm -hmm. on the agenda is continuance requests. Can you read those for us, please, Mr. Chambliss? We have three uncontested requests. First is item 19, DA 26084. Defer to July 9th. Item 23, SPUD 1217, defer to July 9th. And item 24, SPUD 1220 to July 9th as well. Is there anybody who wanted to be heard on any of those items? If not, I'll take a motion. Oh, I I'm can't, I'm can't quite get used to this. I wish you would you would make your motions out loud. Um, I have a motion by Scott Cravens, a second by Mike Privet. Uh, cast your votes, please. Hinkle votes yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Those items are continued. We have one new continuance request, I believe. Yes, item 20, PC 10665, applicant request to continue to July 9. Is there anyone present who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Claire, motion to approve. Coffee, second the motion. I have a motion and a second to approve, to uh, continue item number 20. Cast your votes, please. Oh, I can't, I, haven't, I don't, can't do that yet. I'm sorry, should I change it to Mary Coffee for the second instead of Mike Privet? Um, uh, I think so, yes. Inkle was a yes. Thank you. I think that's backwards. You show it was, okay, sorry. Is that right? That's right, I think. Mm -hmm. <sighs> We're waiting on two votes. Mr. Pennington, got him. And the motion carries. So the next item on the agenda is the consent docket. These are items that are uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, there's no protest on any of them and um, we are moderately confident of their passage and therefore we vote on them as a block. Would you read those for us, Mr. Chambliss? Yeah. Consent, uh, six items on the consent docket today. Item one, C6562 is the extension of the preliminary plat of Sycamore Gardens. It's north of Southwest 15th Street and east of Czech Hall. Item two, C7164, is the preliminary plat of Sy Sycamore Gardens, Section 4, uh, same location. Item 3, C7165, final plat of Palermo Place 4, 
and that's south of 134th and west of Western. Item four, 7167, final plat of the Grove being part of, uh, let's see, it's located west of Portland and south of 192nd. Item five, C7169, final plat of Valencia Park, 22, located south of 192nd and west of Penn. And item six is CE1019, an application to close the west 300 feet of an east-west alley located east of Brookline and south of Southwest 8th Street. Is there anyone present who wishes to be heard on any of these items? If not, I'll take a motion. Asa moved. I right, second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Cast your votes, please. Hinkle is a yes. Thank you. And the motion carries. Items one through six are approved. Janice, this is yes. Susan. Um, yes. You need to be sure. You need to be sure and get Mary's uh, vote by voice if she's not voting. It's, I don't know if her voting is working now. It wasn't earlier, but I believe it is. It showed on that on that okay. vote. Okay. Thank you. Just making sure. So the next item on the agenda is items requiring separate votes. All right, first item for public hearing is item seven. It's PUDSP 1674B. It's an application for a specific plan in PUD 1674 located at 73, or excuse me, 3700 Northeast 104th Street. And this is an application for one building in a development known as Fusion Industrial Park. It's located west of I-35, just south of Hefner Road. Uh, staff's review found it to be uh, meet the requirements of the uh, PUD and Brody Tucker uh, represents the application. Um, JJ, is this the first specific plan under the PUD? No, there was one other. And so an overall sign plan was submitted at that time? If they proposed any signs, when they do propose signs, they will come to the Planning Commission, freestanding signs. Mm -hmm. So it does not apply to the attached signage is what you're saying? No, ma'am. Okay, I was a little confused by that language in the staff report. Okay, uh, commissioners, do we have any questions of our applicants? If not, I'll ask, is there anyone present who wishes to be heard on this item? Uh, we're here if anybody does have any questions. Otherwise, um, you know, this is similar to the previous buildings that were uh, approved in specific plan process in the development already. And the signage, Janice, to answer your question specifically, it is directly attached to the buildings. Thank you. Thank you. you bet. Commissioners, I'll take a motion. This is, this is Commissioner Pennington. Um, I'm happy to move approval of item seven. I'll second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number seven. Cast your votes, please. And Commissioner Coffey uh, votes yes. Commissioner Hinkle Mary. votes yes, but for some reason now I'm able to vote on my screen, so. See if that works. It seems to. 
Yadim carries. Yadim carries. Okay, item eight, application for deed approval 26094 by Omar and Christina Khalil, um, property located at 4520 North Grand Boulevard. And this will require a variance to section 344C2F of the subreg. This is an application to split the property to create one more residential lot because the property has already been split twice uh, that is the limit for administrative deed approvals. So any further uh, lot splits come to the, the planning commission and require a variance. Uh, Christina Khalil is the applicant. Commissioners, this is, a, this is an odd little piece of property if you uh, happen to be by it. Uh, it. It is really tucked away uh, in a quiet little neighborhood uh, north of a little church property. It was a huge, huge lot at one time. It's been split and split again. And now this final portion they're seeking to have split to permit two single family homes. They'll have enormously long um, uh, lots, but you know, they'll have, they'll take their frontage from um, Grand Boulevard, which at this point is not, doesn't really go anywhere else. It doesn't attach to the north and it's not, it's not any kind of frontage road or anything on uh, the Lake Hefner Parkway. This is really, really tucked back um, uh, in a quiet little spot. I have uh, no problem at all with approving the, the lot split. I think it'll be a wonderful use of the property to have a couple more houses in there. This is Commissioner Clare. I have a question probably for uh, staff. Is Grand Boulevard paved north of Northwest 44th Street? So it's not, it's not uh, improved at the same standard that the area south of 44th Street is. Uh, so it's not, a, it's, not a curb, it's not a curb and gutter section? No, it's not. The right of way extends to the north end of this property, but the, the street is not improved at the same standard. So is there any requirement um, under these lot for these lots to be developed that uh, grand be improved? That's really a decision that will come at the time of building permit. There are other options that they could extend it with a revocable permit to do something less than city standard. They could put a think, drive, connect a driveway to the end and and uh, yeah and that and, and that's my only question because as you look at it right now it looks like the south lot has a driveway but the north lot does not so right. they'll have to extend that to yeah. provide access to the northern portion of the lot. But yeah, I think it's probably more um, apt to think of this portion of Grand uh, North of 44th as just a, a long driveway. It's not really what you would think of as a street. Anyone else? Is there anyone else who wished to be heard on this item today? If not, I'll take a motion. I know that the chair can't move um, approval and this is in her award, but just for the sake of process, are we needing, should we take a motion to approve item eight and just assume that it requires the six necessary votes or does the motion need to read that we are approving the variance? That's a good question. Staff, what's I your think... advice on that? Do we? I think you should vote on the variance and then the item. Okay. okay. I agree. <laughs> I, Thank you. I, thanks, Susan. Then I go ahead and uh, move uh, variance as requested in item eight to section 3.4.4.C.2 uh, subsection F. Second. 
I have a motion and a second to approve the variance to item number eight. Cast your votes, please. Commissioner Coffey, yes. 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 Commissioner Hinkle, yes. Thank you both. The item passes. Uh, then, Madam Chair, I, I move approval, approval, excuse me, of item eight. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number eight. Cast your votes, please. Commissioner Coffey, yes. Hinkle, yes. Item eight is approved. Thank you. Item nine. So item nine is the uh, preliminary plat for the Grove phase 15. It is located west of North Portland Avenue, north Northwest 178th Street. Um, the developers proposing 113 single family lots and one common area on 27.91 acres yielding a gross residential density of 4.04 .04 dwelling units per acre. The site is currently in PUD 1111 in tracks 2, 3, and 18 of that PUD. Um, the predominant zoning in there is R1. Uh, lots in this plat will range in size from 6,000 to 14,000 square feet. Access to the development will be taken through previous phases of the Grove, primarily Section 11. Um, the Grove subdivision occupies the majority of, a, of an entire section, so these connections within the subdivision lead back to Northwest 178th, Northwest 192nd, North Portland, and North May, so they have uh, more than adequate connectivity uh, for the entire subdivision. There are five TEs. The applicant is in agreement with the TEs and Tim Johnson with Johnson and Associates is representing the applicant and should be on the line in, in case you have any questions. Commissioners, do we have any questions of our applicant? Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? Neither appearing to be the case, I would take a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, hearing no, uh, no other comment on it, um, the uh, staff report notes that the preliminary plat complies with the subdivision regulations and the applicants in agreement with the TE. So I'll make a motion to approve C7166 subject to the technical evaluations as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number nine. Cast your votes, please. Ankles, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Privet. No, oh, sorry. Motion passes and item number nine is approved. Item number 10 is the preliminary plat for Annecy East. It is uh, located north, or excuse me, south of Northwest 150th Street and west of North MacArthur Boulevard. Um, they're proposing 147 single family residential lots in four common areas on 75.52 acres, yielding a gross residential density of 1.95 dwelling units per acre. 
They're proposing private streets with this subdivision. The site is currently zoned R1. The lots in this subdivision will range in size between 6,700 square feet and 20,000 square feet. Access to the development will be taken from one median divided connection with North MacArthur Boulevard. They're proposing an emergency access, a gated emergency access that will be permanent at the end of St. Maurice Court, which will also access North MacArthur Boulevard. There are five TEs. The applicant is in agreement with TEs one, three, four, and five. They are requesting a variance to TE2 to the subdivision regulations, uh, which requires interconnection between quarter sections and then also connections with adjacent parcels. That is section 5.3.1.D.5. Tim Johnson with Johnson and Associates is representing the applicant and he is on the line if you have any questions. I do have a question. Uh, I'm just a little bit confused here uh, with respect to um, the access. Um, it, page eight of the staff report indicates that the pro proposed preliminary plat request to revise the eastern half of a preliminary plat approved 2019, so very recently. Uh, and the new preliminary plat removes an east-west street connection over the creek that would have provided access to the western half of the subdivision. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about what has changed to um, uh, prompt you to seek that change to the preliminary plat. Uh, yes, this is Tim Johnson. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so we did not start this project. There was another engineering firm involved originally, and there it was a layout, uh, street configuration and layout that included quite a bit of encroachment into the waters of the United States. There are five locations on this site where we're dealing with the Corps of Engineers on waters of the United States. Uh, so when we got involved, it was at the stage of needing to do something with the Corps and as a result, we determined it would be better if we redesigned the subdivision to basically leave the core alone and mitigate the uh, requirements and cost of the uh, Corps of Engineer improvements. Uh, in addition to that, an oil company came in and took a, a very large piece of property on the west side of the creek, which is the uh, lakes at Annecy that I think you've already seen. Uh, which then created an impact to the, the whole addition by losing the number of lots we could get uh, yield totally. So the developer made the decision at that time that the cost, the, the, the 750,000 to a million dollar bridge that it was gonna take across the creek was not cost effective. And so therefore we designed it as two subdivisions. Uh, and we, we're taking all of our access on this subdivision uh, from MacArthur, the lakes at Annecy, which is on the other side of the creek, is taking two entry points off of uh, 150th Street. Uh, and this variance that we're asking for is really a variance to make connectivity to the R2 tract that we don't own to the northeast. Um, and because we're private streets, we did not want to create a stub up there to uh, duplex development. It's a very narrow duplex lot tract uh, and then commercial on the hard corner. Okay, well that answers one of my questions because I, I was a little confused about exactly what the variance was. So that, that relates to your access to the north. Correct. Okay. Okay. Commissioners, do we have any questions of our applicants? Um, this is Commissioner Cravens. I don't have any questions. I just, I was going to kind of remind people it's if you're in the twilight zone or you feel like you've seen this before, it's because you have. As Tim said, this came through once before. We had the discussion about connectivity and private streets, uh, the issue with uh, that natural separation in the middle. Apparently, since Tim's referring to them as waters of the United States, he floated a log test on that thing. Very nicely done there, Tim. Um, and uh, But we've, we debated this before. I, I looked at it again. I don't have any 
concerns, given that discussion we had previously, um, or the way that it sits out. Again, two points of access, taken out the separate streets, they cut it in half. Um, it's not ideal, but I think it makes sense given the, uh, the difficulties with the site. So uh, I'm, I'm in support of the application. Uh, no, no issue with the variance for me. Uh, if other commissioners want to make comments, please feel free. Otherwise, I'll make a motion when we're ready. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Uh, hearing no further discussion, I will first make a motion to approve the variance to C7168 varying section 5.3.1.D5 of the subdivision regulations. Second. I have a motion and a second by Commissioner Coffey to um, approve the variance to item number 10. Cast your votes, please. Inc. was a yes. Thank you. The motion is approved. I'll make a motion to approve the application for C7168, item number 10 on today's agenda. I have a motion and a second by Commissioner Privet to approve item number 10, cast your votes. Commissioner Coffey votes yes. Thank you. Hinkle yes. Thank you. The item is approved. Hey, item 11 is SP 544. It's an application by American Fidelity Property Company for a uh, hospital located at 8516 Broadway Extension. Uh, this is a two acre site. It's located east of Broadway Extension at Northeast 85th Street. Uh, request for a fairly small hospital and surgery center. It uh, includes seven patient rooms and three surgical suites. Uh, staff review determined it meets the standards for special permit and recommends approval with no TEs. Uh, Tim Johnson represents the applicant. Commissioners, do we have any questions of our applicant? Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. I move approval of item 11. I have a motion Seconded and a second. Motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 11. Cast your votes, please. Commissioner. Yes. Coffee, yes. Thank you. Item number 11 is approved. The item 12, SPUD 1219 is an application by Ramjack American Leveling to rezone 6225 Shiloh Boulevard to a new SPUD. Uh, this is a one acre site. It's located on Shiloh Boulevard, which is just south of uh, 59th Street and west of Highway 152. Uh, we're rezoning to an SPUD with an I-1 base, and it permits all the current uses in the existing PUD, but adds retail and construction sales and services. Uh, this represents really an expansion of the, um, their existing business, which is located next door to the north. And it was, um, and it's on SPUD 646. It was zoned in 2012 to add construction sales and services. Uh, staff found it to be in conformance with urban load Luda and consistent with the area and recommends approval with one TE that the applicant is in agreement with and Mark Grubbs represents the applicant. Commissioners, do we have any questions of our applicant? If 
there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I do have a quick question. Just for sure. the sake of clarification on the I-1, even the construction sales, that still is required to be indoors too. Just wanted to just make sure I was clear, right? Yes. Okay. I'm good. If there are no further questions, uh, Commissioner Coffey, I recommend approval uh, of SPUD. One, two. Subject to uh, technical evaluation one. Claire, second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 12. Cast your votes, please. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Coffee. I'm sorry, is mine not recording? Yeah. Thank you. The motion passes, item 12 is approved. Item 13, SPUD 1223, application by TJK Investments to rezone 14429 Southeast 59th Street from the AA Agricultural District to, the, to SPUD 1223. This is a uh, two, about a two and a half acre site on the north side of Southeast 59th, east of Henny Road. And we're going from AA to a spud with a RC rural commercial base. Uh, there's two buildings currently on the site. Uh, one is a commercial building on the front and a building that used to be a church building in the back. Uh, there's paved and gravel parking in place that the spud intends to utilize. Staff found it to be in conformance with the rural low Luda which supports one to two acres of limited commercial to support uh, rural residents. Recommend approval with no TEs. Robert Kohler is the applicant. Uh, my, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I do have one question with respect to the parking. Does the parking that they have meet the requirement or it, you know it's we're sort of deeming that it does how far off are we it's it's hard to say since it's not paved and striped They're, well the portion in front is but they have a, a paved area to the east and then a, a gravel area north of that i think it would satisfy the required number of spaces but they're just not there to count i see okay thank you Dennis, I, I'd love to throw a follow-up question on that. Um, I note that in our, uh, our staff review uh, under traffic, um, we've got kind of a typical comment here on the number of driveways. Yeah. And, it, and it says it should be limited to one for safer ingress and egress. Uh, uh, there's no technical evaluation on that, but I would like to ask the applicant um, uh, respectfully, if they would consider a single driveway, that would help me be comfortable with the application and, and uh, comfortable supporting it today. Uh, good afternoon. This is Robert Kohler, the applicant. Um, yes, that would be plenty fine. It's at the apex of a hill, so it does have good visual on both left and right side, but it does have two entries. So it currently has two entries? Currently, yes. They've okay. been there since 1965. This is Commissioner Claire. I just have a question. Um, on your outbuilding that sits behind, what kind of uh, vehicles will you have accessing that? Will you have truck, um, tractor trailer access? To that? No, it's actually going to be like a medical grow facility. So there's going to be very little traffic, one to two vehicles per day if that 
So for me, um, although I know it's, as you point out, they're existing driveways. Um, and this is a question for, for JJ. Um, if we approve the spud with one driveway, um, are they allowed to keep the existing and operate as a, as a non-conforming until, you know, some future redevelopment? If we limit it to one and they come in for any kind of permit, they will have to remove that driveway. Okay. And that's the only reason why we didn't make it a TE because they're existing. Right. They have been existing for some years and they have fairly yeah. good separation. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be punitive on this. So yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that then. Never mind. Hey, um, Commissioner Claire, just for the point of clarification on your question, I just, I know, I know you know this, but I just want to make sure that it's clear that, I mean, they've got retail sales and services in general, for example. So Dollar General comes along and pulls an application for this, pulls a permit and builds it. Now you're going to have semi trucks delivering and there's nothing to prevent that. Yeah. Well, and my my only point of that was I'm okay with two driveways if we're separating types of vehicles. Um, it, it makes it safer. Yeah, understood. I, I just want to. I, I don't know if there understand was, exactly why you were. I don't know if there would be a way as the owner, but I would be more than willing to have that added into the spud um, for no large vehicle traffic to be used on the property. Um, the location is not going to be good for super high-end retail as far as, you know, Dollar Generals or, or anything like that. So it's going to be a low-volume type of business that's always going to work in there. Um, you know, office spaces, uh, delivery type of businesses, nothing that's going to need a large amount of traffic in and out. Mr. Kohler, with all due respect, I understand that that's not your intention, but one of the things that we like to make clear, and I know there's some folks that are signed up uh, on to, hear, to be heard on this as well. Once it's rezoned, anybody can come use it. So always is a strong word, um, which is why I just wanted to clarify for Commissioner Claire that that point. So I'd like, I'd like to ask a question too before we go to hearing from um, community members. Um, I noticed that there's the use unit for dwelling units and mixed uses. What what it, dwelling units and mixed uses? Is that just any house or JJ or what all is included in that? It would allow residential and commercial uses in the same building together. Like if you wanted to add an apartment in the back of one of these, something like that. But it would not allow for a standalone house, right? Or a standalone no. apartment or it would have to be attached and part of the building. Okay. And JJ, this has been, these buildings have been non-conforming since forever, right? Yes. Right. Right. I do, I know we have a number of, um, people who have uh, submitted protest. I don't have anyone signed up to speak. Is there anyone present who wishes to be heard on this item? I if not, I'll take a motion. I'll uh, move approval. Do I have a second? I'll second the motion once available. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 13. Cast your vote, please. Commissioner Coffee, yes. Oh, can anybody hear me? Hello? Yes. Can, oh, I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, it, my name is Scott Hartzog. I live uh, directly west of the um, of the property in question for rezoning. Uh, I submitted a petition uh, on very short notice to the uh, the surrounding community, and I got a very resounding uh, uh, no from everybody that is closest to the facility or to the 
to the property in question. Um, so I, I appreciate you uh, letting me speak here on this. Um, some of the worries that we have are the, um, the scenic value of the property of the uh, actual Southeast 59th altogether uh, with this, uh, with whatever this front building is going to be. I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what's going on with that. I know I've been told that the back building is a medical marijuana grow, which is totally legal and not here to dispute that at all. That is, um, that's, that's fine. I just don't know why we're, in my understanding of it is we're trying to rezone just the front building. Um, so if I could have uh, Robert, the, um, the buyer, explain to me more what his intentions are with the two buildings, uh, that would be great. And I know there are others that want that as well. Mr. Kohler, did you want to speak to that? Um, sure. Uh, as of right now, um, I am the, the property owner, and I have at least to a gentleman, and his uh, first intention was to just do a medical grow, but um, he did say that the state was passing legislation to be able to deliver the medical marijuana, and he knows that that's not a good high-volume retail location. So he wanted to set up a business to be able to deliver it because of the good access to I-40 and the southern part of the Choctaw, the 7302 area code. Um, so he's not wanting to get volume of traffic in there, but be able to have it in a good location to be able to go out. So then, then um, and thanks, Robert, for clarifying that. So then uh, the only traffic would be coming in would be the amount of amount kind of business that he, he may or may not have, or she may or may not have, meaning that, which to me is, is pretty open-ended. I mean, is that one vehicle coming and going, or is that a fleet of vehicles? What does all, all of that entail? And on this petition that was signed, I don't know if the uh, members are familiar or familiar with the area, but uh, it is, it is dangerous because people drive, you know, it, the speed limit is 50, but people drive a lot faster than that. It is on top of a hill, and I mean, living right next door to it, um, you don't stop at that stop sign to uh, pull out on uh, Southeast 59th. If there's nobody coming, you just go because it's just um, people come flying over that hill. So I have real safety concerns just about the um, uh, the area. And now we're talking about uh, you know people using that to stage. Um, a way to sell and delivering it to people, as I understand, which seems like that's only going to impact that further negatively to me. Um, from from my understanding, based off of what I talked to on the previous owner, they had, and, and I don't know this number exactly, but you know, upwards of 200 people for their church. Maybe it wasn't that much, but 150, 200, somewhere in there, and the amount of traffic would be drastically less than it was for the uh, previous tenant that was in there for, I believe, 12 to 15 years. So the number of traffic would definitely go down. That that is the case. That was Delbert Reed, Pastor Delbert Reed, across there that uh, had the church. But that traffic was on Sundays, um, and and church traffic on Sundays in the morning is not really what it is. Uh, you know, Monday through however long you plan to stay open. I mean, your hours of operation. You know, um, I think you had mentioned to me on a previous phone call that that eight o'clock would be the time that you would be winding that down uh, ever uh, at night. Um, so I guess I want to ask, you know, what what are the days of operation and what would the hours be? I I would be more than willing to adjust them to you know fit the community. I would want um, as a neighbor to it for it to be something that I would be happy with too. Um, if, if 8 o'clock in the p.m. was sufficient for me to tell my tenants to shut down, I would be more than happy to tell them that. Um, I don't believe that they're going to be open past 8, and I don't believe that they're going to be open on Sundays and not open until probably 10 to 11 a.m. Uh, okay. Will you repeat those out for me, please? Uh, they do not believe to be open past 8 p.m., and won't open until 10 to 11 a.m. and will be closed on Sundays. Okay, uh, so that's 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
Monday through uh, Saturday. Saturday. And I don't believe the traffic to be very much at all. I, it's hard for me to say based off of somebody else's deal, but the two people that are doing it are a husband and wife, and I, they don't have employees. So it would be one person there and one person delivering. Okay, so it would just be one. It'd, be, it'd just be one vehicle delivering then, correct? To my knowledge, yes, that is correct. Okay, I mean, if if it turns into a fleet of people coming and going, I mean, what what's to say that can't happen? To play the devil's advocate. Yeah, I I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I I I don't foresee that happening. And you know, if there was some way to write it down that I could keep them from that, but because what they're leasing the building for is not that. So that would have to be at least three years from now. But, hey, I might guys, say, um, it sounds, I don't know. It's to me like, it sounds to me as if the issues to be resolved here really have more to do possibly with uh, lease terms than they do with the zoning. Mm -hmm. um, and so perhaps if you two would like to um, exchange information, if you don't have it already, it's, did, I, did I hear somebody say that you'd already talked by phone? If there yeah. are, if there are details about the operation that you think need to be worked out, perhaps that's something that you might do privately between yourselves, between now and the time this matter lands at uh, city council. I, I'm, I'm, all for, I'm all for trying to, to, to uh, you know, work this, work this out. I was always a good neighbor with uh, Delbert Reed uh, with the church next door. Um, I want to be a good neighbor. I just want to know what our community is getting into because, like I said earlier, everybody that is surrounding that piece of property to be rezoned is not comfortable with the open-endedness of what can or can't be done with the property. So, I mean, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here, but it, might it be better that, that Robert, that uh, – you kind of get together with us, uh, being uh, that all the people that signed the petition, which there were 14 uh, of the houses close by and closest proximity, uh, to determine, you know, what you're getting into, what we're getting into, so that uh, there's no surprises for anybody. I'd, I'd be willing, more than willing to meet uh, and further discuss that. Yeah, I'm available, yeah, I'm available anytime. Um, does, does that mean that we should move this motion to table this motion then for this zoning until we uh, hammer out? The Madam details? Chair. Well, at the moment, uh, excuse me, at the moment, I have a motion to approve, a motion and a second, and we have cast our votes, I believe. Um, so I don't believe we've passed votes yet. This is Susan. We I have cast votes. We have cast votes. We have cast votes. We have cast votes. Uh, the, so, the only, the only, excuse me, the only, uh, thank you very much. The only reason why I'm speaking up, uh, speaking out of turn as late as I did was I was having technical difficulties uh, <laughs> trying, to, I trying to reach guys. So I I've understand. Been, I've been looking at 129 uh, to, 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 to have our point of view heard. So um, someone give me a bit of advice here about what would be required if we were going to seek to continue this item rather than vote on it today? What would need to be done at this point? Well, you would need to do a motion to uh, re reconsider your vote I, and then I, make I, another motion to continue it. Our, our vote has not been tallied yet, I don't believe. Yeah, Susan, they haven't voted. They have a motion and second, and the uh, mover and seconder can uh, request their motion be withdrawn, and then you're back to the uh, item. Okay, that's what I was asking a while ago, and I was told that they already voted, so. We, ha we have cast our votes. It, they, um, they have not been tallied. I'll put it that okay. way. Okay. Then, yes, you can just either amend your motion or withdraw it and make another motion to continue. Commissioner Privet, this is in your ward. It was your motion. Yes, I will withdraw my uh, motion and uh, move for a continuance so the uh, landowners can meet with the uh, developer. Is the applicant in agreement with taking, um, it'll be a month 
till July the 9th to meet with the neighbors and see if uh, these matters can be resolved? Yes, that sounds good. Um, what, let's say I, let's say I get eight out of nine, 10 things that they like and everything's good, but there's one thing that we can't agree on. What will that mean next time we come to the same position? Well, we'll have to wait and see. You already had um, uh, a pretty good chance of getting it approved today. So we'll see what happens. Okay. That works for me as the landowner. So I have a motion to continue this item until the July 9th meeting. Do I have a second? Claire, second. I'll give our staff just a second to adjust that. I have a motion and a second to continue item number 13 until July the 9th. Cast your votes, please. Hinkle, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Coffee. Commissioner Coffee. Mr. Chairman, if he appears uh, mute. The motion passes and the item is continued. Item 14. Sorry, I was muted. Item 14 is PED 1767. Application by Bentwood Investment to rezone 1800 Northwest 115th Street from R1 to PED 1767. Uh, this is a 22 acre site that's going from R1 to a PUD with an R3 base. Uh, the application has been amended since you last saw it on May 28th to eliminate multifamily as a permitted use. It now permits single family through four family. Uh, staff found it to be in conformance with the Urban Low Luda. Uh, recommends approval with two TEs and David Box is the applicant. Commissioners, this is a, an item that has um, undergone quite a lot of, uh, well, uh, amendment and, and uh, change since uh, it was first submitted. Uh, the basic overall idea for the, for the development, I think, is the same. It was always intended to be a residential development. But uh, meetings, repeated meetings with the neighbors to the east and our... Um, educational neighbor to the north um, have, I think, yielded a, a better product, frankly. Uh, there's been agreement by the applicant to limit the um, type of, of housing uh, on the eastern half, is it half the eastern side of the property that backs up to the neighborhood to the east. Uh, to single or duplex development. Um, and uh, a number of, of small changes, a specific plan will be submitted, uh, platting will be done. Um, these are going to be private streets. There'll be signage posted uh, as uh, in accordance with uh, public works desire to indicate that city maintenance of the streets is not 
um, being done and so on. Um, Mr. Box, did you have, did you want to tell us more about this? Sure. So uh, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Um, Chairman Powers, myself, uh, my client have had multiple uh, meetings with, with both different neighborhood groups, the neighbors to the east, the residential neighbors, as well as the uh, Heritage Hall uh, folks to the north. Um, I think at first there was a little bit of confusion as to what its current zoning, that being R1, would, uh, uh, I guess, dictate would be built. Um, when we walked through and kind of explained what neighbors were getting here compared to what can be built pursuant to R1, um, I think there was an overall level of uh, satisfaction with what the product was that the neighbors were going to get. Uh, and then my client further went in and has agreed to some some efforts that will seek to, I think, make better currently bad traffic situations that exist along Bel Air, uh, which is the north-south uh, thoroughfare street in the neighborhood to our east. Um, so all of those things combined, the the last Zoom conference we got, I think the, the sense that both myself and uh, my client, as well as I think um, the chair re received was that there was um, support and at least um, satisfaction with all the modifications that we were able to to come up with. Um, there, there are two TEs. Um, the first being uh, a request that we agree with, um, but we would ask to, to modify it a bit so that the common area can be spread across the development um, and not just in that southwest corner. And then you know it, it talks about the um, protection of the trees. Um, we're going to protect the trees where feasible, but it is anticipated that southwest portion uh, is going to have to have uh, our detention facilities there. If you were to look at a flood map, you'd see that the southwest portion has both floodplain and floodway. And so inevitably, there will be a scenario in which some trees have to be removed. Uh, the staff has seen to try to, um, I guess, remedy that by asking that if new trees are not, or if trees are not retained, that new trees shall be planted and come here to achieve a ratio of one tree per 3,000 square feet. And my client does agree to that. So essentially what we're asking to be revised in TE1 is um, allow us to spread the common area out over the um, development. In fact, I can just read into the record um, the language we suggest if that is easier. Um, what we would suggest is TE1 to read, provide two acres of common area within the development. The common area should retain existing healthy mature trees when feasible and may contain amenities for residents. If existing trees are not retained, new trees shall be planted in the common area to achieve a ratio of one tree per 3,000 square feet of common area. Um, TE2, we would seek to eliminate that. Uh, it is our intention to install speed tables along Bel Air Place. Bel Air Place is the street in the neighborhood to the east. That neighborhood has experienced significant traffic problems uh, with speeding from 115th down to Hefner. Uh, that was one of the major concessions that satisfied the neighbors. And so we do intend to build speed tables there. Um, and so we would ask you to eliminate TE number two. Did we ever, did we as a city decide that those were okay again? No, in fact, we would ob object to the elimination of that TE. That, that really has no business in, that, that's, it's not even a part of this PUD. It's an offsite improvement that's just basically not permitted on public streets. Um, so we would ask that that be eliminated. It doesn't really have any business in this PUD. Back okay, back. So they, can gonna, attempt, they can attempt to do something like that privately, but it doesn't have any business in the, as a PUD requirement. Okay, so there, I think there are two issues here. One is whether it's appropriate to include that language uh, as a TE, uh, given that the property in question is not within the confines of the property sought to be uh, rezoned. So that's one question and we can talk about that. But the other question, the question of the t speed tables, uh, you know, we spent a lot of years working out traffic calming techniques that, uh, you know, the traffic commission initiated that were worked through at length with public works, I don't, I don't understand this uh, idea that these are not allowed. It, you know, we started off with maybe a dozen traffic calming techniques. It was narrowed down to a handful 
but this was definitely one of them. I can remember that pretty clearly. Yeah, this is Commissioner Claire. I can I can give a little background on this. So um, what has gone to traffic commission was public works and a subcommittee, uh, or excuse me, the traffic department and a subcommittee of traffic commission uh, put together a toolbox of traffic calming techniques and they evaluated close to a dozen um, and of, of various types. And so far to date, one of those options has been approved and I believe that is speed bumps. Um, and to my knowledge, that's as far as it's, it's gone. So it's, it's kind of got high centered. Um, and, and I don't, I don't know the current status of it, but um, in my opinion, there's been a lot of effort and a lot of background to put together a lot of options um, and it's not going anywhere. So um, I, I completely concur, uh, agree that, uh, you know, uh, these, these are all options that are uh, valid and, and need to be pursued, but, um, and, and, and maybe it's something that's planning commission that we can help um, help nudge along but but that's that's kind of the background is there there has been a lot of effort um, but we can't seem to get uh, some of these options approved well I think we're about to get there and I think this case is, is what's going to uh, allow us to, to help us get there uh, this is very 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 important to the council person for this work um, I understand that public works has not found a way to have um, what they need. I have no idea why, um, but it's hard for me to imagine why all over the country cities have figured out how to use speed tables and we're unable to figure out how to do it. Um, there are agreements with neighbors and PUDs, I think all the time. Uh, understanding it's an offsite improvement. I understand the current view of speed tables as we sit here today. I'm here to tell you that by the time this item gets to council, perhaps there's a different view and it is critically important to the neighbors, my client, the council person, uh, that this be a part of the, the document. I just- And I just, I'll, I'll, should... I'll go even a little bit further than that. I mean, we, uh, you know, we had multiple discussions with the neighbors. Uh, they were uh, righteously indignant about the idea of this development. They had a, they were quite vociferous about their objections to it um, until, <laughs> and, and it was mostly because of the traffic issues that they face. When this proposal was made by the applicant, um, it, it completely changed their view of this development. I don't think I have anybody, I don't have anybody signed up. We'll see, I guess, when we get around to that part, whether there's anybody uh, you know, who's, who's listening in and wants to speak on this item uh, from the neighborhood to the east. But if not, it is because of this agreement. I don't often go against staff on things like this, but I want to see this TE eliminated and I want this language retained. I, I would at least consider, David, re rewording it a little bit. Um, to say they shall be built if for some reason in the future they cannot be. You're, so, so you're, you're tied up in PUD with something you have no control over. Right. So we could say they shall be built pursuant to approval by the city of Oklahoma City since it is a public street. You can put some kind of caveat like that in there. I'm fine. Okay. Well, I don't think there's any question that since it's a public street, there's sure. not going to be anything that is done over there, uh, you know, to Bel Air that is is not being approved by the city. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I don't anticipate the city saying no, and you'll find me out there on a weekend installing a speed table of my own just to make make good on this promise. Okay, <laughs> install one here too because we've been wanting them for years and not been able to. Well, Commissioner, I hope this case is going to get each of you the ability to have speed tables in your ward where you so desire. I don't see how that happens, but okay. Hey, yeah. JJ, can, can, can you give this Commissioner Cravens, can you give me another example of a time where we have approved or required 
offsite improvements outside of a a zoned parcel uh, this is this is, i feel like we've never done this before is that correct or am i not right about that david seems to say we've done this before i don't remember one none come no specific ones actually come to mind can you even legally do this david i don't believe that you can legally do this sure How? it's an ordinance but but what you're requiring doesn't it's not within the it's not within the zoned area it's not within the ordinance you're creating it's a totally different property well that's fine but, but it's still, i think it's, your your question scott is whether we could require it of him that's right we might not be able to do that legally but he can certainly commit to doing well, it well that's that, that's my point I, 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 just so i can get this out of anybody's head i'm all in favor of these traffic calming measures and all that being installed i just want to be sure that neighbors are actually going to get what they're bargaining for here outside of a, I mean, because this is something that I feel like should be a private agreement that was a contract that was entered between the parties, not a part of this, because I don't see how it could ever be enforced. I don't see how it could be required. Well, um, and I, I did just have a text message from um, Mr. Johnson, who said a similar agreement was reached in for a Waterford offsite drainage improvement. You would find I'm not going to say it's lots and lots, but there are instances where offsite improvements because of agreements to be made with neighbors have been accomplished through a PUD. The idea that you have a neighborhood like this, that I believe the HOA is informal and not mandatory, and that we would go and seek to, you know, engage in a contract with all of these individuals on a public street is just not going to happen. I'll have to have legal explain this to me later, like I were three, because I, I, I don't get it. And I think this is dangerous for us to go about it this way. I get that we want to see it happen. I think it's a great idea. I, I think it's brilliant. As Mike said, I think there's, Commissioner Brevet, I think there's a bunch of neighborhoods that would love to have these type of traffic calming measures, but I just don't want to set a precedent through a zoning case that isn't enforceable. That and, and all of a sudden we have people coming in and asking us to require things of Apple. Just it just seems like a real slippery slope. That's all. Well, again, if the city was requiring it, it would be another matter. This is a self-imposed thing that the the, the developer is willing to do on a, onto a public street. Well, understanding the public works are going to have to sign off on it. And that language is being and that that's the language that JJ suggested that you're, you're in agreeing to is that so long as the city of Oklahoma City approves their installation, you're agreeing to install them. Yeah, so the language I have and then we'll add subject to review and approval by the city of Oklahoma City. And I just wanna say, um, oh, really this, no is Su this is Susan. And I would, I've not seen this before either. So I mean, as far as a legal opinion, I'd want to actually research that as far as giving you a legal opinion i mean i'm i'm all for this thing i i can't stress that enough especially if the neighbors and the developer in agreement i, I just want to make sure that we're using the tools at our disposal to create something that's precedential that could actually be used in the future and we have confidence about the outcome that's the only thing i'm saying and I think, you know, we have the option, we have the ability to resolve that issue between now and city council, so. Let me just go ahead and ask, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this matter? Do I have any neighbors that have been listening and waiting to speak on it? I'll give it just a little extra time. I know some of our neighbors were sort of technically challenged. If not, I'll take a motion. I 
Okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll be the one. Um, I move approval of item 14 with the following amendments to the technical evaluations as read. Amend PE number one to the language. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, amend TE number one with the language as read into the record by uh, Mr. Box. Amend technical evaluation number two to also reflect the revised language provided by Mr. Box. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Ankle second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 14 with the uh, amendments to TEs one and two that were read into the record. Cast your votes when you get the chance. Ankles, yes. The motion passes and item number 14 is approved. Thank you. Item 15 is PUD 1770, application by 9000 Broadway to rezone 8300 Broadway extension uh, to PUD 1770. Okay, this is a site on the east side of Broadway extension at Northwest 82nd Street. It's going from an existing PUD 1665 and it provides for a 30 foot, 650 square foot multi-tenant development sign for the, uh, the entire development extending north. Um, staff found it to be in conformance with Urban Low Luda, but suggested that the, if this is truly to be the only multi-tenant development sign for this development, we should limit it to that. However, the other two PUDs to the north include their own large multi-tenant signs. So we worked with the applicant to come up with a way to limit the entire development to this one multi-tenant sign through a plat note. The, the balance of this development will be included in one subdivision. And we've had a note on the plat that states that multi-tenant development signs would be limited to the one sign in this PUD 770 as depicted on exhibit C. And that's reflected in your technical evaluation. Uh, Tim Johnson is representing the application. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to add a little background to this. Um, so there were multiple PUDs done on this property simply because it was acquired over time uh, from different entities. And so as we went forward with the development and added more land, we basically duplicated the same PUD uh, going forward. So now that the development has uh, moved ahead, we have public streets creating a circular condition, uh, 82nd to Oklahoma, north to 85th, and then back to the frontage road. And, um, the developer has uh, engaged a national advertising agency to come up with this sign. And they have agreed, uh, as JJ mentioned, to limit the any further uh, uh, signage along the frontage road to uh, this one large project sign. It's obviously, it's a, it's a true mixed use. It is, uh, it's got corporate office, it's got entertainment, it's got uh, proposed food venues and a multifamily wrap project up by the lake. Uh, once you get into this development, it drops pretty radically to the east uh, elevation wise and uh, the, the PUDs do allow for additional monument signage uh, <coughs> and we'd like to leave that in there 
because some of these parcels are very large. The Delisi Corporate Office, for example, is a very large tract. Uh, Chicken and Pickle is a very large uh, venue, uh, as will be the apartment project. So they just want to have the ability to, none of them may be eight feet tall, or some of them may not be eight feet tall, but uh, they're going to be uh, unique to the user. So there'll be a project sign for the apartments. There'll be a standard chicken and pickle sign that they use nation nationally. And then Delisi will have their corporate uh, name uh, on a monument at the corner of uh, Oklahoma and 82nd Street. I'd be happy to answer any questions. There is that one TE that we do agree to. Tim, I, I have just a few little detail questions to ask you. Um, on, my, on page two of my staff report where it shows the um, comparison between the PUD 1665 standard and the proposed standard, it, it seems to indicate that there will be no, no landscaping at the base of the sign. Why is that? So that's something that the uh, staff is kind of uh, pulling away from and understand, we understand that it's uh, not going to be a requirement in the new sign oh. ordinance because of lack of maintenance and lack of the ability of city staff to uh, police that. Uh, if you've been to the addition, um, we have boulevard streets with trees lining both the center and the sides, uh, all in all the boulevards, including the private 83rd Street. That runs east. Uh, so it's, this is going to be a well manicured addition. Uh, and so there will be landscaping. It's just not going to be required landscaping. It, it may not, not have flowers. It'll have low lying shrubs and some sort of maintenance uh, provision in there to keep people from beating up the metal sign. Okay. So having said all that, I'll just throw out there that it seems to me that staff may be jumping the gun a bit on what's going to be required by the new sign ordinance. And I wish they wouldn't um, drop these things in on us. If we're going to stop requiring things like this, it might be worth discussing with the planning commission and having some kind of, you know, consensus about. Um, so there's no pole signs, but there are these kind of metal rods, it looks like, at the bottom of this sign. Is that right? Yes, it's, uh, I mean, it's part of the architectural design. Okay. Uh, the line's going all the way through from the top to the bottom. Okay. Um, I, do I understand correctly as I'm reading this that, that the sign shall have a maximum sign area of 650 feet per side in addition yes. to EMD signage? I mean, the, the EMD signage is not part of that 650 square feet? Yeah, and there's no EMD signage permitted in any of the floods that can be seen by the highway. Okay. That's a little unclear to me from just the way it reads in the staff report. Um, and then, and then I, also, in the staff report, page seven, uh, the second to the last paragraph, it says monument signs, uh, blah, 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 with structures located in this PUD or consistent with an established development theme. What, what does that language mean exactly right there? I'm reading. It, it seems to me to relate back to the requirement that um, signs with a split, that it, it, it relates back to the covered in a material consistent to the structure or, consist, or consistent with a development theme. Right. So, so, that, so, so the, the covering on the signage or the monument signage would, you know, let's say we used a slate cover on the building, we could bring that slate coverage out and be part of the signage. But that would be a material consistent with the structure. This Correct. is an or, or consistent with an established development theme. Right. So, for example, the chicken and pickle, they may have a, a theme based on the color of their courts uh, and, and what they do for entertainment. So we have not seen their sign package yet. So I'm just using that as an example. 
Okay. Now, I'm, I'm a little um, unclear about that. I remember when the, um, yeah, I'm it, was it the, the Humvee dealership that moved in off the very northern edge of Oklahoma City? They had this giant sign thing that they wanted to do and it was because it had big metal bolts on it and so on. It didn't meet sign code at all, but it was consistent with their theme for their vehicles. And, and you know, I that just seems a little fuzzy to me. The consistent with an established development theme is a little uh, fuzzy. Well, in this case, the development theme is, is what you see is the yellow, the half. Uh, so one of the signs may be, you know, ABC restaurant at the half, and they may carry through this development theme of color, or they okay. can their own theme as part of the, them being a chain restaurant or something like that. Okay, that's the intent. I, I, I think yeah, I get the intent. I'll just for the record, it's a little fuzzy for me. Um, but that's all I have. I, I'm glad that we got out up front that this is that this these signs this sign is an addition to the monument signs that will be throughout the development it's not an either or generally when we approve tenant signs like this it's instead of the signs for each um user the separate signs for each user but here we're talking about doing this in addition to so That's correct. And, you know, okay. we're on a very heavily traveled highway. Uh, we have ele elevation challenges. So this is being located on the high spot of our property. Once you get into the property, you won't be able to look back and see this sign. And so the monument signs are intended. And, and you know, we're a thousand feet in from the frontage road before you turn and go up Oklahoma. And so it's a, it's a very lengthy street circulation. It's public street inside there. Very large property. Okay. That's all I have. Others, commissioners, we have questions for our applicant. Is there anyone present who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. I move approval of item 15. Do I have a second? No second. Mike. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 15. Cast your votes. Ankle is a yes. Thank you. Thank you all. The motion passes, the item's approved. Item 16 is a request to annex 8.47 acres of unincorporated Cleveland County land into the city of Oklahoma City. Susan Atkinson, Planning Department, has a short presentation. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, Yes, thank you, Cindy, for getting our screen sharing going. Um, this is the first of three items related that you're going to, to consider this afternoon. This is actually not an action item uh, because it is a, an annexation request that was previously reviewed by the uh, Ad Hoc Annexation Committee on May 11th. So again, we'll start with just a brief description of the annexation request. Uh, then we'll move into the comp plan amendment and then a, a colleague will discuss the zoning case with you. So just briefly, the city received a request to annex a 8.4 acre parcel in the, um, 
in that part of uh, Oklahoma City that where Moore and Norman or Cleveland County all come together. Um, and so you can see the parcel in the dashed red outline. It is again, an 8.47 acre parcel. Next slide, please. So on May 11th, the ad hoc committee considered uh, a staff report on this request. Um, again, the request raised no objections from city staff and uh, the staff report recommended approval. Uh, the ad hoc committee subsequently voted to recommend approval to city council and council will consider this request uh, sometime during the summer of 2020. Uh, I wanted to add that the applicant's attorney is on the line and may want to tell the commission a little bit more about the process. David, are you on the line? Yes. Please sure. go ahead. Yeah, so David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Um, it, yeah, so the map that you're looking at now, my client owns uh, everything that's outlined in white. And with that, um, the majority of the site is already in the city of Oklahoma City. You've got this strange little swath through there uh, in which it is an unincorporated Cleveland County. So we have one uh, development, it's a single family development, um, which you'll have a comp plan change next, single, uh, the rezoning application after that. And then in July, you will see the plat for this development. Uh, but in order to make this development move forward, we needed all of it to be within one jurisdictional control, that being the city of Oklahoma City. So we made application. Um, we filed our notices with the clerk of Oklahoma City, published pursuant to the statutes. Um, the, the city's ordinances are frankly fairly um, silent on annexation. As, out of an abundance of caution, the city uh, puts these items through planning commission. Um, it's debatable whether or not the planning commission under the statutes and ordinance um, ever even hear these. Uh, the ordinances, or excuse me, the statutes seem to indicate we go straight to council, but um, the, the practice has been to go through planning commission to, uh, for a recommendation, um, which is a bit odd because like um, Susan had said, we already have gone to the ad hoc uh, committee on annexation that consisted of, uh, as I recall, Todd Stone, uh, David Greenwell, and Larry McAtee uh, on this item, uh, and they unanimously recommended approval of the annexation that will be then put forward to city council as soon as at some point this summer. So uh, it's, a, it's a statutory process to annex into a municipality. And we have uh, followed that statutory process with working through the city attorney's office as well as the city clerk's office. And, and we now find ourselves here before you on annexing the, um, that small piece of the overall development. Great, David, thank you so much. Uh, if, if there are no questions from the commission, uh, we will move ahead into the presentation of the comp plan case before you. Um, I, I just, this is Susan, I have one question. Um, I think we do make a recommendation for approval or not on the ordinance, annexation ordinance. Yeah, yeah, well, you are what I, okay. I, my only point was the statute doesn't require it. The city's right. policy is to have the planning commission uh, take a vote on a recommendation. Yes, I agree, but I think I, I think we do need to take an action at some point on the on this item to recommend approval or oh, not. You're saying before they move on to, to the next item on the agenda? Yes. I agree. And is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Or if plan, I mean, commissioners, is there any discussion to be had amongst the commissioners on this item? This Commissioner Hinkle. Yeah. Yes. Here. I'm looking through the the next couple of three applications. The fire department wording for sprinkling houses has worked its way back into our conversation again even though the city council hasn't come to terms with what they want that wording to be. And I'm just curious what our thoughts on that are. Well, I was going to address it at the zoning. Um, yeah, let's phase. push that off until zoning. Well, if there's no other discussion, then I'll move approval on moving this forward.
I have a motion. Do I have a second? Commissioner, Ms. Commissioner Coffey, Cravens, I'll second the motion if nobody else will. Commissioner Coffey, beat you to it. I have a motion and a second to approve, uh, to recommend approval of the Santa Fe Crossing annexation. Cast your votes, please. Ingles, yes. Thank you. The motion passes. The item uh, is approved. Okay, we'll go ahead and move then to item 17, which is the associated comp plan amendment with this case. Um, again, we've set up the geography for you. Um, in this particular case, because the parcel was not in, in the municipal boundary, it did not have uh, a designation in the comp plan. Um, but again, we're talking about an 8.47 acre parcel and the staff recommendation is that uh, it, it and the applicant's request is that it come in as an urban low intensity parcel. Uh, again, we mentioned to you that there's an associated zoning application which will combine this eight-ish acre parcel with the parcel to the north um, uh, in order to create a 52.3 acre uh, parcel for low density residential use. You will consider that again in the zoning case in just a minute. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just the, uh, the customary map uh, that shows you where the subject site is relative to the city as a whole. Next, thank you. Um, and this describes the land use and existing conditions in the vicinity. As you can see, the parcel we're discussing here abuts a, um, a an urban low intensity parcel um, to the north. Um, there is urban reserve to the west. That area is not in play here uh, at the moment. So again, you can see that the applicant's request is fairly consistent with the prevailing land use in the area. Next slide, please. Um, again, we've just talked with you all many times about what urban low intensity is and, and the fact that it applies to the least intensively developed areas of the city that still receive city services. Next slide. Um, in this particular case, the area will be served with water and wastewater. Uh, in both cases, uh, the subdivision to the north uh, of, of the uh, north but one of the subject parcel uh, is fully served um, and, and uh, it's in an open sewer shed. So it's an easy matter to extend water and wastewater services south to this parcel. Um, it, it was mentioned uh, a second ago that the, this, this area does exceed rural response time. That is most certainly true. Um, this is a, an edge location of our city. Uh, very unlikely that there will be uh, a fire station built in this vicinity, possibly ever, uh, but certainly not for a long time. Uh, one of the things that had been in process around the time this application was received was discussion between the city of Moore, the city of Norman, and the city of Oklahoma City for mutual aid agreements. So we did include the fact that the city of Moore fire station uh, nearest is about two miles northeast of the subject site and Norman's fire station number eight is located about two and a half miles south, southeast. So um, while initially this would be a situation that would trigger uh, the much discussed um, uh, consideration of sprinkling, uh, it is also true that if administrative agreements could be worked out with adjacent municipalities, uh, I think there's general consensus among staff that emergency services could be, could be provided for this parcel. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, this is just uh, a, a survey of the zoning in the area. Sorry, office sharing. <laughs> uh, and then again, these are the existing land use uh, in the vicinity. Uh, there is uh, uh, low density residential to the north. We've talked about that a couple different times. This is still a largely undeveloped part of the city. Um, it is slowly changing um, as, as um, uh, time passes. Next slide, please. So in terms of our recommendations, we recommend that you um, consider designating this parcel as urban low. We believe that is uh, consistent with development and density patterns in the vicinity and that the applicant will extend water and sewer services to the area. And of course, we talked just now about the um, emergency services situation. So if the commission has any questions for me, I will try to answer them. So I, I just wanna be clear, this is not like a maybe the applicant will extend water and sewer. No. That is part of the zoning request that's, that's under consideration next item up. That's correct. And, and it was included in their CPA application that this is their intention. Commissioners, do we have any request, any uh, any um, questions for um, Ms. Atkinson? Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Commissioner Hinkle, I'll move item 17 forward. I'll second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 17. Cast your votes, please. Ankles a yes. Thank you. The motion passes and the item is approved. Item 18 is PC 10656, application by area development to rezone 17701 South Santa Fe Avenue from the AA Agricultural District to the R1 Single Family District. And this is 52.3 acres. It's the 8.47 parcel up for annexation plus 43 acres currently in Oklahoma City. That's zoned uh, AA. David Box represents the applicant. Yeah, good afternoon. Once again, David Box. Um, this is the companion item that is now um, urban low intensity, um, and we're asking for your approval on the rezoning application. Like I mentioned, you will see the associated plat on your docket in July. Um, so um, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions and um, good after your approval. There are no TEs. Do we have any questions of our applicant? Mr. Commissioner Hinkle, my question about the fire suppression still stands. Yeah, so uh, we don't agree. Um, the city has the authority through the city council to go enact an ordinance. Uh, and short of that, we do not agree to um, sprinkle the houses. If uh, the city council passes an ordinance, then that's that's the rule. Um, that's the way it'll work. But uh, to be treated differently, I think, is uh, inequitable. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm sure there will be some sort of in a local agreement with Moore and uh, Norman to serve this. So we would ask uh, to, to, I guess I just, for the purpose of the record, I just, I, we object to anything related to sprinkling, understanding that this is a straight zoning application and there is no um, ordinance on the book. So we couldn't condition this anyways, but we object. I think it, 
this. And I'll I'll direct my question to staff, I guess. My understanding of um, the straight zoning request is that we are really not in a position to condition approval on sprinkling the houses. Am I wrong about that? No, that's correct. Um, you know, I, I really wish that we could um, get some clarity on this item. I'm, as we've, you know, we've talked about this before. Um, if it's if, if it's a safety issue, uh, you know, to me, I think it needs to be done. But it's it's got to be a, a consistently applied standard. And uh, you know, I I would really, even if we had the ability to to require it today, I think I would still be inclined to to sort of punt this decision. I believe it's entirely likely that there will be um, cooperative agreements. There are two fire stations uh, within two miles, you know, in uh, opposite directions, of course. But, um, you know, the idea that there are gonna be homes there that are built, you know, at, a, at an urban density, uh, R1, you know, that are beyond the rural response time, that is really problematic for me. But it also seems entirely possible that that's not ex that's not actually what will happen. So, um, and and frankly, on a straight R one request, we don't have the authority to require them to sprinkle. So, uh, let me weigh in here for a second. This in Ward Five is like Commissioner Craven's pick a corner in his neighborhood. I realize that Norman's part of it and Moore's part of it, but within the next five or six years, you're going to have four corners of 400 home neighborhoods. And if the people of Norman and the people of Moore aren't required to sprinkle their houses, then this applicant just loses that all the way around. Because, and I understand about the, the cross city agreement, that's an awesome thing, but to saddle him with this going in is, to me is just unfair. And I realize we may not have a say so in this, but I just, I had to speak my mind. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Anyone else have anything they want to say? Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. <laughs> I will uh, move to move case PC 10 Six five six forward to city council. I have second. a motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve item number eighteen. Cast your votes, please. Tinkles a yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion, the motion carries. The item's approved. Items 19 and 20 were deferred. Item 21 is a resolution adopting ADAPT OKC, which is the citywide sustainability plan, as an amendment to our plan. And Tina Bowman with the planning department has a presentation. Thank you, JJ, and thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I would also like to take a moment while I pull the presentation up, uh, take a moment to thank City Manager Craig Freeman uh, and uh, so the assistant, assistant City Managers, uh, Aubrey McDermott, Laura Johnson, um, and Kenny Sudel for their uh, support of this effort. Uh, it's been uh, several years of uh, extensive research and uh, planning that went into this document. Um, and this, the city manager's office created a real uh, environment for collaboration that will help make this plan a success. Um, so what brought us to today, um, this consideration for the first sustainability plan for um, Oklahoma City um, to be adopted as a comprehensive plan uh, amendment. Um, we uh, held a, a public comment period from um, Earth Day, April 22nd through uh, May 20th, received over 
uh, 200 comments, uh, a lot of very robust comments via email. Um, and so we, uh, we thank the public for their engagement and their interest in this topic and, and all of the topics covered here. Um, and again, for the, for the supportive comments we received. Um, so this plan, uh, it's important to, to draw a distinction between adaptation and sustainability. While they are, uh, rec we recognize they're not the same thing, um, sustainability seeks to ensure that we have enough resources for uh, survival in the future. While adaptation is a, is a constant state of refinement, we, we're looking to uh, continuously improve uh, to have a, a future generations a chance to thrive in the future. So that's what brings us uh, ADAPT OKC. Um, and so again, the purpose of this plan is to strengthen our community. Through our research, we found um, several challenges. We've identified some and we've, we've, got, uh, we've, we've gained a further deeper understanding uh, of, of others. Um, and and uh, those, those will be discussed uh, as I go through each chapter. Um, so the plan, again, is a, is a long range policy doc document, much like ones you've seen uh, presented in recent days, uh, Bike Walk OKC, um, preserve OKC and, and AMP UP OKC, the Arts Master Plan, all pieces of, of Plan OKC uh, implementation. And so that's where we see this uh, fit in. It, it dives a little bit deeper into some of the issues that Plan OKC has, uh, has, has uh, identified. And uh, so this, this plan recommends and prioritizes strategies and actions that will help us achieve uh, the goals that you'll see outlined here. So what the plan does not do uh, it does not, it's not an ordinance and it doesn't override existing regulations or policies uh, or priorities that council may have. Um, and, but it is, um, it, 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 we, how we vision this coming back to you is in packages or in, in individual proposals uh, that will be considered uh, at that time. And so each of those uh, may have a public process involved. Uh, and we do foresee some of this plan uh, potentially being implemented through the unified code development uh, or unified development code update uh, that is ongoing. Uh, I believe in phase two right now. Um, so uh, why do we need to adapt? Um, that we, we conducted a, uh, a project across five uh, with cities across five states in the Midwest region uh, called Climate in the Heartland that helped, uh, helped us see downscaled uh, projections into the future for the next 30 years and, and 30 years beyond that on what the future looks like for Oklahoma City in terms of um, average annual temperatures and uh, annual precipitation uh, effectively the effects of climate change. Uh, and so what, what that, in addition to the, net, the most recent national climate assessment showed us, uh, we can expect an increase of average annual temperatures in Oklahoma City. And, and that's difficult for the layperson to understand uh, or, or to, to realize what an average annual temperature increase. It means we're gonna have a lot more extreme days. Um, in fact, the, the national climate assessment goes as far to say um, the top 2% of hottest days, that is those that are between 95 degrees and 100, uh, the, that we receive about seven on average every year, um, we, we could see an increase of about 27 of those uh, by, by mid-century. So we could have more than a month's worth uh, of, of super hot days um, by mid-century. Um, and that also goes for nights. We could see an increase of 35 uh, of, the, of the 2% warmest nights uh, by mid-century. So the, the warming trend that we see and the, the dry, um, hot summers that we see that again, affect vulnerable populations, affect electricity use, uh, usage um, and, and uh, a, a lot of things. Um, that, that is uh, something that we've, we've identified in the plan and have recommendations to improve. Um, again, as far as precipitation goes, we can expect to see about the same amount of rainfall on an annual basis, but we're gonna see it in shorter bursts and, and more inundation events, more risk of flash flooding. Um, so what we wanna do with our recommendations is, is seek- Hi, Carrie. Excuse me? Okay, Hi. I'm sorry. Uh, what, what, we, what we hope to do is, is, is to uh, reduce operating and maintenance costs for, for city operations, but also make our community more prepared uh, and resilient into the future. And that's what, um, that's what our how will we adapt, that's what our, our recommendations will point to. Uh, we want to mitigate the urban heat island. Uh, and we also want to look at the ways we use electricity, um, energy efficiency, whether it's for city operations um, or through energy codes for, for new construction, uh, or for retrofit programs, that is revenue. Um, and so we need, to, we need to view it as such and treat it as such. Um, and then also we wanna look at the way we generate electricity and, and, and rely more on clean sources, on, on renewable, uh, renewables, uh, solar, wind, that, that come with also good paying jobs um, that can help uh, diversify our economy uh, and, and, and keep us a little bit, um, keep our air a little bit cleaner. 
So the outline of the plan, we have four chapters uh, of content uh, in terms of topics. So energy productivity, that's where we, we talk a lot about energy generation and, and how we use it. Um, natural and built environment, uh, air quality and waste reduction. Um, and then at the intro, we do talk about the history of the office. The office was created uh, in 2009-2010 through the stimulus package, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Um, Oklahoma City received about $5.4 million uh, to implement a series of projects, one of which was created, create an office of sustainability. So that's why we're here and that's why this plan is here. Um, and then again, we have policies and implementation chapter that covers uh, how we plan to do this, the priorities we have, and start by dates, which is important to note are not wait until dates, um, those are we, so we can be opportunistic as implementation uh, presents itself. So the first chapter, and I'll go through each chapter and talk about the, just the goals and initiatives at a high level. Um, and if there's any questions, feel free to, to jump in as I go. Um, but for energy productivity, we want to reduce emissions associated with energy consumption. And so again, that's, that's twofold. We want to um, be more efficient in how we use power and we want to uh, use clean sources of energy uh, or to generate electricity. Um, and so um, what, there, there are several ways to do that, um, but, but one important factor of why we should do that is electricity right now is, is cheap uh, in terms of the price of it um, in Oklahoma. And, and, and that's across all sectors compared to national averages. Um, we have cheap costs or cheap, excuse me, cheap prices of electricity. Um, and what that does, uh, that that's actually means that we, we, we use a lot more than other places because if something is low, low priced, um, a lot of it more will be used. So we do use more per person than the national average, um, which means um, low, low income households, households that may not be weatherized, they face a larger energy burden um, whereby they spend more of their, um, at their, in their income, their total income, but a greater percentage of that on just paying their utility bills. Um, and so that's something that we, we, we think um, it is a challenge and needs to be addressed and, and can be addressed um, through the tools we, we lay out in the, in the plan. Um, so again, I, I mentioned diversify lo local and state uh, economies through uh, job creation. Uh, and that's both through energy efficiency and renewable energy jobs. Um, with energy code compliance also can come uh, job creation. So um, that's, that's where we wanna go with, a, with a energy productivity. Natural and built environment, this chapter looks uh, largely at water quality and the urban heat island effect. Um, so the urban heat island effect is uh, the phenomenon where uh, urban areas, where there's a lot of asphalt, a lot of buildings, um, things that absorb heat and thermal energy throughout the day, they can be up to 22 degrees hotter than uh, a nearby undeveloped area, a greenfield. Um, and so that can have really negative impacts for vulnerable populations or uh, people with respiratory illnesses, or if there's a global pandemic that's a respiratory illness going on that those can ha have exacerbating effects. Um, and so with, with uh, the, the mitigation of the urban heat island, we wanna increase vegetation. We wanna preserve old growth trees um, and, and, and do that in a strategic way, in a meaningful way, not a broad blanket approach um, that's, that's gonna have unintended consequences. So again, as, these, as each of these recommendations come back with, with proposals, there will be engagement with developers, engagement with uh, affected stakeholders um, that will be able to move these forward in a really meaningful way. Um, and then we also want to uh, uh, look at food insecurity issues and, and be sure that residents have the ability to grow their own food. And, and one of the, uh, the most preeminent comments that we've heard was the ability to sell the food that they grow at their house, cottage food industry. Um, that is legal at the state levels, but there are, there are zoning um, aspects of it that make it uh, not allowable in, in Oklahoma City right now. Um, so uh, diving deeper into that, low impact development uh, can help catch that first flush of, of rainfall. As I mentioned, with an increase of inundation rainfall events, um, we could see a lot more of that pollution from streets and parking lots. Oklahoma City is made up of, uh, our total surface area is 4% made of parking lots, um, just the land use of parking lots. And so that's where we store cars. Cars are dirty and have oil and, and gasoline and things like that. And as it rains, all of that, that first five minutes of rainfall sweeps the pollution straight into our, our natural water system. Um, there's no treatment, there's no pretreatment before it reaches our lakes and streams and rivers. And so that means we, we have to treat that before it becomes drinkable water again. Um, and so that's, that's an important aspect where low impact development, rain gardens, bioretention cells, these types of things can help improve the water quality of our stormwater runoff. Um, and then also we want to increase uh, pervious surfaces um, so that we have, we have less of this. We can decrease the volume and velocity of, of, in, of rainfall events and inundation events uh, by doing so. 
the air quality chapter, uh, largely we're looking at uh, mobile sources that contribute to our emissions here. Um, so we have greenhouse gases uh, that contribute to um, uh, climate change effectively. And then we have uh, uh, the, the ozone precursors that are measured by DEQ and, and reported to EPA um, that affect our attainment designation. And, and that's, a, that's a threshold set um, by the EPA that the, the DEQ monitors for us. And effectively, the, the, the precursors for ozone are volatile organic compounds. Um, and uh, I just spaced on the other one, <laughs> volatile organic compounds and uh, uh, nitrous oxides. And, and those, when those are present, and, and that's basically exhaust from, from vehicles, uh, so from mobile sources, when, when, when those are present on hot windless days with sunlight, that's what creates ground level ozone or smog as it's commonly referred to. So that's what's measured uh, in terms of wh whether we're in attainment or not. And that's a very important, um, that's a very important distinction uh, to, to, to remain in attainment because uh, there are studies, uh, Austin Round Rock is one, that I believe it was anywhere between uh, 27 and $41 billion uh, over the course of about 30 or 40 years that it could end up costing their economy uh, if they were to go uh, a high level of non-attainment. And there are, there are varying stages of, of attainment. So it's important to reduce the emissions. It's important to support transit, to support um, bike walk OKC and, and, and multimodalism to be able to um, use our vehicles less. But we also recognize that, that our commutes right now are, are by and large more than 80 percent, 86 percent single occupancy vehicles. And so by doing by uh, by we, we don't anticipate that in the future, in the next 10 years or so being cut in half or anything without the introduction of, you know, regional rail or something like that. Um, and, and so what we what we think we can do and what we think a real opportunity is, um, is is being able to convert that to low or no emission. Uh, so by encouraging the use of alternative fuels, electric vehicles, uh, compressed natural gas, uh, these types of things can reduce uh, the amount of congestion and, and, or excuse me, can reduce the amount of emissions associated uh, with our commutes. Um, and then also uh, we, we want to address uh, sustainable transportation infrastructure funding, how we get, uh, you know, funding for, to maintain roads and, and, and streets. Those are, uh, that's through a lot of times through gas taxes and, and but in Oklahoma, uh, since FY96, and that's 1996, um, on average, since then through, I believe, FY18, um, we average about a million dollars total um, annually uh, in terms of how much gas tax the city of Oklahoma City receives. And we receive, you know, this was something I, I reinforced in, in the study session that we held. Uh, we receive zero, zero dollars in diesel tax. We're, we're at the crossroads of America at, at I-35 and I-40. We have a lot of truck traffic and expect to have an increasing amount of truck traffic uh, given the way that uh, online shopping is increasing um, and, and, and these types of things, we, we don't anticipate freight traffic slowing down and especially doing less damage to our streets in Oklahoma City. And so um, that's, that's a real policy issue or a, uh, something that's, that's uh, in the apportionment formula at the state level um, that we would look to, um, look to address. Uh, in waste reduction, uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward. We want to, we want to send less uh, stuff to landfills in, in, in a variety of ways. And some things are hazardous, medical sharps and pharmaceuticals and have water, water quality problems. Um, so we want to make sure people have the right avenue. Sometimes people flush those things and that's, that's not where it needs to go. Um, that causes other problems. So having avenues for those, that type of waste, um, as well as generally e expanding beyond, um, expanding the focus just beyond the residential curbside programs uh, which again have have made leaps and bounds of improvements and have have collected a tremendous amount uh, more materials uh, since the switch to 96 gallon rolling carts. Uh, I believe participation is 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 as high as it's ever been, um, and so interest is very high in, in in diverting more waste from landfills and again creating that circular economy where we have uh, v materials that are valued, therefore creating demand um, and 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 are be able to be purchased. We want to leverage the city's purchasing power. Uh, to be able to buy materials with recycled content. And we also want to encourage um, other industries to do so as well. Um, and so the more, the more uh, materials that are available, um, the, the more likely there will be products made with recycled content. Um, and again, we can, we can have that closed loop cycle. Um, and again, my, here's my contact information. Uh, I failed to put the website uh, okc.gov backslash sustain. Uh, but again, I, I thank you for your time and consideration and, and happy to answer any questions. Hey, T.O., this is uh, Asa. Um, I, I hope you'll excuse me um, uh, paraphrasing, you know, my interpretation of the document for, for 
I guess everyone else, but it's my, I guess, I guess to put it all in a sentence, I would say that um, the city of Oklahoma City, like most American cities right now, is headed toward financial ruin if we don't take these things serious. And I, and I mean that. And, and we look at these things and we kind of like, you know, think that you know, there might be quote unquote cute ideas or, or nice ideas, but these are very necessary. I think everybody should be taking this stuff deadly seriously. Um, and uh, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my take. Um, thank you, Mr. Bowman, very, very much for your presentation and for all your hard work. Uh, I think we do take it pretty seriously. And I'm just so pleased that we have taken now this additional step, that we're moving in the right direction, that we have a framework that's going to help guide us as we take those steps. Uh, and I think the city's commitment to sustainability is very real and will only increase over time. But thank you so very, very much for your expertise and your effort and your time and your energy. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the other half of the sustainability office, um, our associate planner, Ryan Baker, uh, who put countless hours into this plan and has spent the last three months uh, being the epitome of a, of a public servant um, and, and, and helping the emergency manager um, with, with understanding of and collection of data and, and, and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, you know, jack of all trades and, and you know, you, you, can, you can put him anywhere and, and, he'll, and he'll work until he can't work anymore. So uh, a, a, a big lift for him and, and, and a big thank you to him too. Absolutely, absolutely. Other commissioners have comments they'd like to make? I'd like to echo Janice. You guys, you guys put a lot of work into that. And thank you for some insight. Thank you, Commissioner. So do I have anybody who wishes to be heard on this topic? If not, then I will take a motion. Our I resolution would love is to adopt uh, ADAPT OKC. This is Commissioner Highsmith. I'd love to make the motion um, to adopt uh, the resolution for uh, uh, adopting ADAPT OKC. Second. I have a motion and a second uh, to approve item number 21. Cast your votes, please. Hankel is a yes. Thank you. The motion carries and the item is approved. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. Item 22 is the election of planning commission officers. Every year at this time, in accordance with the bylaws, the uh, chair and vice chair are open for nomination. Madam Chair, this is Rusty, if I may. Um, I had a couple of conversations on this recently and uh, I'm prepared to make a motion. If, if I can make a few comments, is that okay? Of course, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, had a, I did have a couple of conversations recently and I recall a discussion last year at this time. Uh, we discussed the arguable advantages to rotating the chair on occasion. Uh, Commissioner Cravens was, and I believe still is interested in willing to serve as chair. Um, while I will be making that motion, first I want to comment on how well uh, you have served us in the city as chair. Um, motion to, to rotate the chair is not at all um, a result of any uh, reflection on your service. And to the contrary, you, you've served us tremendously in many important ways. Um, but, I, but I do feel, and I've had these conversations about uh, us rotating, I, I believe you, uh, I asked the other day, I think you have served as a chair since every one of us have joined in just the last few years. We have all served under your, your chairmanship and uh, it's very appreciated. Uh, and if it passes, uh, I did, I'll let everybody know. I had a conversation with, uh, with Madam Chair Powers that she, uh, I'm delighted she indicated she would like to vote in favor of it as well. 
And I'm more delighted, uh, she indicated she would, of course, continue to serve on the commission with us. Um, and with that, unless anyone has anything further, I'm prepared to make that motion with respect to chair. If somebody prefers to first talk about a vice chair, I did not have any conversations on that. I do have an idea, but I can uh, stick with just the chair at this time and make a motion or we can discuss both. Um, I, I think I, I would like to make um, a couple of comments if I could. Sure. Um, we did have this discussion last year about whether or not it is advisable to rotate the chairmanship. Um, I, I think that's not something that I feel as strongly about as perhaps some other people do. Uh, as you know, I served for many, many, many years under John Yokel's uh, chairmanship. And that worked very well. He, of course, did not have, have a ward to represent. He was at large. And so he was free to tend you know, to the duties of the chairmanship. And uh, we, we were never <laughs> inclined during that time to, to consider replacing him. Um, I think that there is a certain um, unification of effort that is, that is uh, uh, important for the planning commission. During the time that I have served as chair, I've tried to make as many of the motions uh, that and votes that we have taken unanimous as, as I could, sometimes voting even against my own, uh, um, I won't say against my own conscience, but my own inclinations, never against my better judgment, I would say, but against my inclinations, because I think it is very important that people understand and recognize the position and power of the Planning Commission. Planning Commission is a statutory body. Um, you may have noticed during the time that I've served as chair, I don't, I don't talk about us making recommendations to city council except in unusual circumstances such as the annexation vote that we had earlier today. Um, if you look at the statutes, the Planning Commission acts the city council is free to overrule the planning commission if it chooses to do so. But I, I don't think of the planning commission as a recommending body and I don't think that that's what the statutes indicate that it is. So I've been, I've been careful about that. Um, and, and another thing that I've done during the time that I was on in the chair is to try to and this was difficult for me. We all have so many connections with the development community and with the people who appear in front of us. I had been practicing land use law, you know, many, many, many years before I came to the Planning Commission uh, and had, have many, many friends who appear in front of us regularly. But I think it is really important that we guard against any kind of perception in the public, right, wrong, or indifferent, and it's wrong 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, that the fix is in or that the whole thing's rigged or that it doesn't matter what people say. We hear people tell us that all the time. It doesn't really matter, you know, that they come down and speak to us. And I think it is so very, very important and vital that they are part of the process. So when, when we spoke about this, I think what I told you was that if Commissioner Cravens is inclined to serve as chair and is desirous of doing that. I don't think that I will oppose that. Not because I'm tired of being the chair, not because I've accomplished everything I would like to accomplish. Um, the wheels of government move unusually slowly sometimes, but because I think it's very important that we act, uh, especially to choose our chair in a unanimous fashion, so. That's all I had to say. Well, well, thanks, and not to act like I'm serving as chair through this motion. But uh, does anybody else have any comments um, before yeah. I try to make a motion? Yeah, Rusty. I mean, Commissioner LaForge, I I want to make one comment echoing what you said in commending Chairwoman Powers because I know that she's just done a fantastic job, and I hope that she knows too that just because we might rotate right now does not mean your turn may not come again. <laughs> so. Be aware of that. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the kind thoughts. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks, Commissioner Pennington. I thought about that as well, because last year what we discussed is maybe rotating every year and going all the way around every commissioner, and including myself, there were a few of us that um, did not want to go that extreme to the rotation. So, yeah, it, it may come back around to the few who are even interested and willing to serve as the chair. Um, so thank you, uh, Commissioner Pennington. With that, is I there might anyone else? My other idea, if uh, unless somebody wants to speak up about vice chair, since Commissioner Pennington just spoke so eloquently, he was the one that I did not have a conversation about. But I'm curious, Kamal, unless somebody else is interested, you, you're always very thoughtful, well scripted when it comes time for you to make your own motion. I wondered if uh, you would be willing to, uh, I think you'd do a great job filling in when we had our chair not here. Um, I can include that in a motion if, unless you object, uh, Kamal, or if somebody else feels strongly they want to serve as vice chair. Uh, this is Asa, and I would second Kamal. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm happy to serve, assuming there's nobody else who wants to do it. But if anybody else wants to do it, it will not offend me if they if they want to do it. But I'm happy to. Thank you. Not it. Is, <laughs> Same. Does, does anyone else? have anything they want to say? I have a motion and a second to uh, appoint uh, or elect uh, Commissioner Cravens as chair, uh, Commissioner Pennington as vice chair. So I have a motion and a second. Would you cast your votes? Any fools, yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Don't sound so enthused, Matt. Congratulations. Congratulations. And thank you again, uh, Janice, uh, Chairwoman Powers. We really appreciate the way you've uh, served as our chair since I first joined and we've all first joined. I, I very much mean that. Thank you so much for the way you've, you've handled the chairmanship. Oh, I appreciate those kind thoughts. Thank you. Um, so that brings us to the end of our agenda, I believe. The other items having been continued. Um, next item is additional items. I don't know what in the world that would be at this point. Communications and reports. Planning Madam Commission Chair. committees. Did you want to speak at this time? Commissioner Yeah, my, my, yes ma'am. My thinking was that that would be under, that would be one of these what goes under additional items, that would be this, uh, or other business, but I'll, I'll defer to you on it. Let's go with planning commission committees. Okay, so um, as you guys may or may not remember, we appointed a sort of a very quick ad hoc drainage committee. That was myself, Commissioner Claire, and Commissioner Powers. The idea behind that subcommittee was to root out um, just kind of the information behind the comment that appeared in our staff reports back in May about drainage that was objected to uh, by some of the applicants during that hearing. And um, I circulated um, a uh, essentially an email that was written by Jared Norris from Public Works. He was gracious enough to write some uh, the, the comment itself along with some color to it. I circulated that memo. Um, as we discussed as a subcommittee to essentially the six members of the engineering community that appear in front of uh, the planning commission on a very regular basis just to get their feedback. Uh, that feedback was received over the course of the last week. I circulated that. Anything I received, I passed along to Commissioner Claire and Commissioner Powers. Um, I had a call today and follow up uh, with staff with Michelle January. Um, and uh, with Jared Norris about this issue. And I just want to give you guys a short update. So there's the history, here's the update. Um, after talking it over with them, uh, they requested a little bit more time to craft some language. I wanted to be uber respectful of the fact that this was staff's note and that we're trying to be timely in staff and getting something agreed upon that can be included in staff reports. They're the ones who, who made that request. Uh, and I, and I'm sure I have no objection to that. I, I just hate to delay it because we only have one meeting in July. So it would be August meeting before this note could be back. I do wanna articulate a couple of things that I found interesting that I'd pass along at this point to commissioners. And I certainly wanna give them a chance to comment as well if they'd like to do so. Um, but 
as I said, Jared prepared a memo. I am more than happy to circulate this to any planning commissioner who'd like to see it. Um, was trying to spare you an email, frankly. But um, Jared proposed some revised uh, language that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and chapter 16 is uh, where these ordinances are found. Um, in summary, there's two components when detention is required. Uh, one is when there is known downstream flooding of structures. And for the lawyers in the group, that's a term of art. Uh, for the non-lawyers in the group, it means that term is defined in the law and structures. And if you read that definition, there is pushback from the engineering community about how that term is being enforced. So what is actually a structure and what is not? Secondarily, there was brought up through the discussion that there is a drainage map that highlights um, where areas of flood and, and prone areas, known flooding issues exist. This map is not a public document. It is not widely circulated. It is not published on a website. It is not available. Um, and I, in, after discussion with staff, I have to say I take some issue with that. Um, primarily because developers know, I know Commissioner Claire and I visited about this a little bit in the engineering world. If you wanna know if a site is subject to flooding, you pull the FEMA flood map and you look and you see if you're gonna have to deal with FEMA um, before you can build within the flood zone, depending on how it's classified. If there's gonna be a map that staff uses to decide where and when detention should be utilized, it should be a publicly and readily available document. That does two things to the development process. It improves the predictability of outcome. And frankly, it gives us as planning commissioners something to swing back against the development community when they bring forth an application that this map exists on and they say, we don't want to do detention here or we want to exclude this comment, we can say the map was there, it was publicly available, you could have reviewed it, you didn't. So it gives us a little bit more teeth to hold them accountable. Um, and, and I'm really not sure why it hasn't been available up to this point, but I would stress to staff that I think they should make this map available and update it regularly and provide it to the public in some easily accessible means. I think it will also cut down on the amount of calls and correspondence that has to take place to get answers about whether detention will be required in certain areas. So those were the two Scott, things out me, of the- Commissioner, Commissioner Cravens, let me ask you, is, is that very issue of the of the uh, need to update it frequently is that what has kept it from becoming a public document is is the concern that you know uh, they they do it based at least in part i don't know if what all goes into it but at least in part based on reported flooding incidents is it is it some reluctance to hold it out as a definitive document because it is so often or regularly updated, do you think? I'll, I'll sort of let staff comment on that. What I would say is staff within the existing ordinance and they articulated there are plans to try to amend or, or alter this ordinance, um, but they do have the tools at their disposal within the ordinance because one of the other conditions, um, Janice, in, in the ordinance is it says known downstream flooding of structures or if it is determined that development of subject property will cause or contribute to flooding to existing right. downstream structures, then they can require. So right. I think all the map would do is it's, it's, it's in practical sense, what it would do is it would let these engineers go and look at this map and see that drainage and public works has designated this area is becoming, you know, we, we essentially are going to say that it is, um, contributing to downstream flood development here would do that. If that map would allow them to see it, they're having that conversation with their with the applicants, with their clients on the front end, instead of letting it get all the way through the process where they've sort of advanced this development plan, set up a site plan, done all this, then they come to planning commission for approval. And now they're just gonna fight for their project because they've spent all this money and time doing it, right? Um, so, that, I mean, that's where the predictability comes in. 
Um, and frankly, there's some transparency there that I'm not totally comfortable with either about not having these maps available if they're going to be used to make these types of decisions. So I, that's a, that's, I just wanted it because I said, you know, I'm not there um, representing me. I'm there on our collective behalf and I'm trying to bring information back to you. I would summarize that as the conflict points for the correspondence I saw. Commissioner Claren, Commissioner Powers, you guys were in on that correspondence. So I'll let you add anything to that that you want to. And then, as I said, I'd certainly like to have staff get a chance to, to, to uh, respond or make their, make their points if they'd like to. So the one thing based on discussion that you and I've had and looking over the um, comments and all around, it seems to me that it's important for us to be focused and, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that this really is an issue that impacts PUDs and SPUDs rather than straight zoning. So we're really just talking about PUDs and SPUDs. And yes, ma'am. And part of the how we got to this problem was language contained in an old PUD because there's no guarantee that those things are going to be developed immediately that indicated that no detention would be required. Years later, when it was determined that it, need, it was needed, it was like, oh no, but it says we don't have to do that. So one of the things that I think we should all consider the possibility of is simply that we stop doing that, that we make it clear through whatever comment or decision we make here about how to proceed that those determinations are simply not going to be made at the zoning stage. They really are very, very seldom, if ever, ripe for determination at zoning. The money, time, and effort to prepare uh, drainage, uh, detailed drainage plans has not been put in at that point for reasons that make perfect economic sense as far as development goes. And so, I mean, it, rather than try to craft a huge big fix for this problem, I think we ought to at least consider the possibility that we simply make it clear that that's not part of what is being decided at the zoning stage. It's already not being decided with respect to straight zoning. Why should PUDs and SPDs be any different? I 100% I agree with all that. and 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 I, And, dare I speak for them, so did all of the engineering folks that we reached out to in reference to that, that you're correct, straight zoning, the drainage ordinance applies, and that they're not trying to use the, so, so the fact that we would include a note that would make that clear to, does not give them any heartburn. It was the inclusion of the note as a technical evaluation, which, and, and I, I tried to call Sarah once today and she wasn't in her office at the time I called, and um, I, don't, I didn't know who else to call with Jeff out, but I'm curious, from staff's perspective too, when we, get, when we get to them and they have a chance to comment, is there really a difference between this being a, uh, a comment in the staff report and a technical evaluation? Um, because if it's gonna universally apply to all these applications, I don't see the need for it to be a technical evaluation. And I'm really stealing that comment from Commissioner Claire uh, made that point. And I think that's exactly right. And, and so, that's why we went back to them refining language that would be included in the staff reports on a go forward for SPDs and PUDs, because everything you said, I totally agree with. And, and frankly, so do they, and they had, they had no objection to that. To me, that just makes a lot more sense. I mean, you know, I, I, I think, first of all, Public Works uh, are, is welcome to put whatever comment they want to make in a staff report about their review and how they see it and what they want everybody to know. And it's there and it's, you know, clearly available to be read. Um, the, the actual status of a technical evaluation, you know, I, I'm not sure I agree that it becomes part of a PUD. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, it, it is a condition of approval, I get that. Uh, but, you know, it's not really added to the document in a way that makes the document cumbersome. That's not my concern. But it, it, I think it is important for everybody, not just the developers and the applicant and the people involved on this side, staff and so on, but pub, the public, those neighbors that live out there to understand that that decision is going to get made at a time 
when a lot more is understood about how the actual development is going to work, the nuts and bolts part of that process. Yeah. Commissioner Claire, you have anything you want to add to? No, it's, it's, Scott, I think you uh, you summed it up very well, uh, very very eloquently. Um, yeah, I just you know through the course of our conversations, I think um, you know it is those comments. I think I feel personally are most appropriate in the staff report, not as a TE. Um, and then just in general, you know, as as applicants come to us, they may be the first uh, the first uh, application uh, out in the middle of nowhere and. And who knows what that's going to look like in ten years? If they don't, if they don't do anything, um, you know, for the first ten years, every property around them could be developed, and that's going to affect drainage and detention. And to have that, uh, to have that in there is that they're not uh, uh, held to held to the standards uh, of current, uh, you know, building codes, and then that needs to happen. So, yeah, agreed. Jared Norris did a frankly, wonderful job representing the interests of public works in our conversation and made a lot of really great points, none of which I argued with and, and nor the developer. So I think everybody's on the same page. It's just making sure that we do this the right way. Uh, I think that's really what this was all about. So I don't know, I, I'm sure Jared's on the line still. If he wants to add any comment or thought to that, I certainly would welcome him to have a chance to comment. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I, I do think that uh, you and, and and Janice, very well spoken on this point, and I agree with I agree with both of you. I, I think public work from public works perspective, uh, you know, we're trying to provide as, as much information as we can to the development community so that as as forthright and and upfront as possible. And I think you know us providing the information as as soon as we can. You know, more information is always better. Um, and I and I agree with uh, Janice that uh, you know this is pro and, and you Scott and the Planning Commission in general that uh, you know this is this kind of evaluation is is really should be subject I think when plans are submitted uh, to Public Works uh, and and we're just you know Public Works is just for trying to provide the information as as soon as we can to the development community so they can uh, to help them uh, with their decision processes as as soon as uh, as soon as as soon as we can um you know that the map when when you state the map that the map is really is is a good start it's a good start of uh you know where that uh, evaluation begins um it's not you know and and, and so when when we make that the the initial comment on the the on the you know the the planning commission you know on the planning commission cases um, that's where that information comes from, but we we really view it as kind of a, as a as a beginning place of this is what the map says. I'd I'd love to, you know, make it more public, you know, especially the process that we have, um, you know, and, and really and I and I really, uh, you know, I, I did have time to look over the comments that the, the consultants made, and there were some great comments um, there. And uh, I, I would love to continue to work with uh, you, Scott. Have the ability to work with you and, and the Planning Commission and the and the Drainage Committee to uh, re really uh, come come to a solution, come to a proposal that you know. And if it's just uh, you know updating a note that's provided on the staff report um, to just really help clarify what the process is and uh, how we go about making the decisions that are are made during the the planning review stage. Um, you know, with respect to the, the issue of the time, I mean, I, I, I don't have any objection whatsoever for, for um, uh, staff to take whatever time they think they need to get this right. It's better to be right than to be quick. And it, really, the, the impetus is from them. They were the ones who were seeking the change. So if they are not in a hurry to have it happen, then, you know, I'm certainly not. If it's got to be August, you know, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. I think that's correct. I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I don't see that, that, you know, I mean, I think we need to take the time to get it right. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's uh, appropriate. Thank you. 
Oh, so my suggestion would just be, you know, Jared, the ball is in, in, in your court, you and, and Public Works Court to get language back that will be included in staff reports. I think the right thing to do is to take your refined language, circulate it for any final comments, whether that, whether that comes before the July meeting or before our first meeting in August. Once we receive it, we can circulate it um, and, and, and await any feedback, and then we'd be prepared to, you know, sort of introduce it here um, in planning commission committees at a later date and just sort of, you know, for lack of a better way of turning into blessing it and so that everybody knows what to, what to expect going forward. That sounds good, Scott, thank you. Thank you and thank you for your work on this. Okay, so uh, there aren't any other planning commission committees that I'm aware of, planning commission members, does anybody have anything they want to share? Planning department? Development services? No. Nope. Municipal counselor? No. Nope. Citizens to be heard. I understand we do have someone who's been waiting patiently all this time. Citizen to be heard. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, is it me, Taylor McKenzie? Am I up? Am I the only one? Entirely possibly. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Taylor McKenzie and um, this has been very interesting. This is the first planning commission meeting I've ever listened to. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to ask a question. Um, I would also first like to acknowledge that this city and state, which you and I call home, is stolen land. That thought should never leave our minds as this city continues to grow and our indigenous leaders should be invited to the table at every city planning meeting. Um, my question is, are there any economic justice measures in place to make sure that there are equitable, equitable, not equal opportunities for more black and brown owned businesses to start and or flourish if they're already going? If so, can you please explain those? And um, if you are not already enacting economic justice reforms, then uh, I think it's time to start listening to our black leadership. You can watch the streamed conversation on structural racism within our city state and country that was held last night uh, by six black women, all leaders of our community, if you are looking for people to bring to the table. Um, black Lives Matter Oklahoma City is also very easy to find on Facebook. It was the city who systematically redlined the east side as well as much of the south side of OKC. Thus, it is the city's responsibility to act deliberately to reverse these injustices. It is critical that the leaders of these communities in which you are developing and redeveloping are, don't, are not only brought once to the table, but are consulted at every step along the way. That black and brown owned businesses are systematically prioritized, for example, within the TIF districts and opportunity zones. We need equity, not equality. All institutions and levels of government in this city, state and country have played key roles in the web of four centuries of systematic racism within this country. I would like to know what steps the city, city planning commission are taking to enact real equitable change. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you for coming. Um, I'm not sure we're gonna be prepared to offer you much of an explanation in response today. Um, you know, we're not really, um, a legislative body in the sense that we're not in a position to enact, but um, I, I, I do really very much appreciate you coming to speak to us. There are a number of initiatives that we have been discussing with respect to particularly housing um, and um, I, I don't, I don't want to monopolize this part of this conversation. There are probably other people who would be better equipped to answer than I am. Well, Janice, I'd love to jump in. This is Asa. Um, I, I do think like, I guess, I guess first, like 
I do believe that the Planning Commission was intended as a legislative body. Um, I think mostly we do administrative <laughs> stuff at this point. But I, I think the legislative part that we that we are taking on right now is is the zoning code update. And I believe zoning, uh, as most of you know, is ha has been a tool um, for, uh, uh, you know, whether intentional or not. I do believe, uh, you know, to some degree it has been in institutionally intentional but there's there's been a racist history in zoning and i think that the city right now has the opportunity with our zoning code update to address some of that and it is absolutely at least for this commissioner part of my intention to uh to try to find the ability for for uh equity and equitable solutions to uh some of these you know historic issues that the city's uh th that is a part of our city's history so I, I, I believe that the speaker, um, the, the citizen that's been heard is, is correct in, in a lot of what he said. And um, I, would, I would answer by saying there's, there's several of us on the commission that, that are aware and, and understand our history well and um, are active in pursuing uh, uh, what I would call, you know, uh, action, I suppose, in that regard. So I, I think the, the citizen and, and I think it, the, the intentions are correct and, and we're we're making that attempt. And I can I this is Kamal. Can I just piggyback off of what Asa said? Because I, I agree with with um, with what he said. And I think that the code update is our opportunity to make the history right, because that is where we have legislative purview. Um, as far as me personally, because I know that the commission has limited ability to directly influence a lot of the policies that um, he that the speaker mentioned in an official way, but I can tell you that I use the platform that we've been provided as being planning commissioners and take that opportunity seriously to go to groups that do advocate for the kind of changes that you're talking about. And I do have regular conversations with Councilwoman Nice about those policies too. And I think it would be nice um, in light of these issues being highlighted now for us to talk more broadly about how we can engage more commissioners in that conversation. But I appreciate the speaker bringing that all to our attention, but it, it's on my mind too. And I may perhaps uh, one of the things that Commissioner Highsmith uh, had me do was read The Color of Law, which was a spectacular book. And I highly encourage all of the other commissioners to read it as well, because it definitely changed my perspective um, about equity and the history of planning and zoning in in our uh, in the across the United States and Oklahoma City's unique history and involvement in that as well. So, um, not in any way trying to downplay it. I'm going to continue to be a fighter for equity in this city, for Black and Brown people and all people in Oklahoma City. And I, I think I think we should all, as commissioners, use our position to fight for that that economic justice. May, may I also add something? Sarah Welch, Planning Department staff, I just want to tell Taylor that um, you absolutely, if you're not already signed up for updates um, on our code update project, it's a great time to get involved right now. Um, you can email codeupdate at okc.gov. You can email me personally at sarah.welch at okc.gov, or you can call me at 297-2283. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And we do very much appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. Yes, thank you for uh, all, all the responses. I'm glad that there are members on the board who find this important. Um, and thank you for the recommendation, Color of Law, you can check it out. And I will sign up and um, yeah, I, I, are there any other suggestions for, um, it's hard for me to navigate right now. I'm just now kind of jumping into uh, getting involved um, with my city government. And I wonder, it's kind of hard for me to navigate who has the answers to these questions. Um, and, you know, like who is making these decisions? I understand it's engineers, it's you guys, it's uh, city council people. Um, but it seems so spread out and hard to navigate. And do you have any suggestions as to who to kind of poke and ask and remind that these issues are very important to the city's citizens? Uh, Sarah, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you'd share my, uh, my contact information whenever he gets in contact with you. 
I'd love to have a copy. This is Commissioner Highsmith, by the way. I'd love to have a copy. Um, I'd be happy to share a copy of the, the, the book that Kamal <laughs> recommended. I have many more copies in, in my possession. And um, I'd love to just talk about, at least from my perspective, you know, the, the other ways that you could get involved um, that I would feel would be, uh, you know, most effective, I suppose. Although I'm not any in any way an authority on this, and obviously I'd I'd love to hear any other comments that the other commissioners might. You know, I think it's kind of an all of the above thing. You know, you it's it's hard to know even for people who who are familiar with the system, it's hard to know, you know, which door you can get your foot in that's going to be an effective outcome. Um, Sarah can certainly get you started in terms of participation. Um, and yes, I, I, I would encourage you to, you know, ask everybody you meet, uh, you know, ask everybody you come in contact with um, the same questions you were asking us. Great, thank you very much. Um, I took some notes and I will be reaching out. Thank you again. All right, I'm gonna get off the line. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Okay. Um, Sarah, when he contacts you, I'd like for you to give him my contact information as well. Will do. Um, okay, other business. Janice, this is Cindy. We have a few participants that have been on the line for throughout the meeting. So I'm not sure if they're wanting to speak or if they're just listening. Okay. Uh, are you wanting to speak? Is there anybody out there who has anything that they want to share with us? That's all the people we had actually signed up, but we're more than happy to hear from you if you are wanting to be heard. Star six to unmute. Yes, thank you. Doesn't I don't like hear it. any takers. Nope. Yeah. Well, in the absence of, of um, any other persons wanting to speak, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded, Nate. How about let's do this by voice? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very aye. much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye. Good job, aye. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Janice.